We'll go ahead and begin to get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Alfred University Bergen Forum. My name is John D'Angelo and I am a professor of chemistry and the coordinator for the spring 2024 season of the Bergen Forum. Today is Thursday, March 21st, 2024. And for those of you attending the forum online, here in Western New York, it is a gray, overcast, and cold Western New York second winter kind of day with a little bit of flurries. But here inside Nevins Theater of the Powell Campus Center, it is warm and cozy. Before starting, we have a handful of announcements. First, next Thursday's forum will be given by Alfred University Professor of Psychology, Robert Maiden. Bob's talk will be about personalities. There are some other events this week to announce. Namely, the winner of the Phi Beta Kappa Wit and Wisdom winner has been announced, Ash Julian. Ash will be presenting their work, Stranger Things' Robin Buckley and the Female Autism Phenotype Theory, at the April 18th Bergen Forum. Congratulations, Ash. Later today, the Division of English will, be, will host a reading by playwright and poet Dan O'Brien at 5.30 in the Scholes Library. One of Dan's plays, Newtown, will be performed at the Jiva Theater in Rochester next month. Also, later today from 4.30 to 6 in the Fosdick Nelson Gallery, the Visiting Artists and Scholars Speaker Series will be delivered by Emily Sarah. There will also be a theatrical sound design workshop on March 23rd from 1 to 7 p.m. Today's forum, and it is, to my knowledge, the first forum that has swag associated with it, so there are some free glasses up front for you to grab on your way out, will be given by Joshua Thomas, Assistant Professor of Physics and Astronomy here at Alfred University, and the title of the talk is Totality in the Way, Shadows on Display, the Solar Eclipse of 2024. Take it away, Josh. for that great introduction. Oh, I can turn myself back on. There we are. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I will move on without further ado because you now know who I am. So uh, a little bit about what to expect in my talk here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what an eclipse is, how it works, um, and some phenomena that you can experience if you are lucky enough to travel to totality, which we will not be in here. Um, so uh, also talk about some of my personal experiences with the totality in 2017 and uh, when and where to view the eclipse. And uh, there's lots of QR codes in my talk. So if that's your sort of thing, you're welcome to scan these as we go. The American astronaut, oh, I guess it's uh, actually NASA's eclipse safety viewing is this QR code here. Um, and make sure you're taking notes because there is a quiz at the end of today's talk. So uh, first things first, I wanted to talk about uh, this big guy here the moon. And uh, so for this, this is a nice, fun, interactive demonstration for those of you here. For those of you at home, uh, you can participate as well. So uh, here's the analogy. Your head is the Earth. Your eyeballs are the people on the Earth. This is your moon. And pick something to be your sun. If you're in the room, it could be me. If you're at home, it could be your computer screen. And so if you put your fist between me and yourself, then you are now uh, depicting new moon. That uh, is one phase of the moon that we should know about. Um, and if you're using your right hand, we're going to go to the what direction your fingers point. This perpendicular is uh, to the line of sight. So if you're at home, your screen's there, your fish should be off to the side. Uh, this is first quarter moon. And if you turn all the way around, that's having the moon behind you. So everyone's fish should be behind them right now. That is full moon, okay? And then now it's behind you. It's got to come around the other side. That's third quarter and then back. So this is the orbit of the moon if your head is the Earth and your fist is your moon. Um, so we're going to talk about what phases of the eclipse uh, this can occur at. Obviously, it's new moon. But we're going to talk about that here in just a second. But first... Um, a sense of scale. So I have here a uh, nice vintage metal globe, and you know it's old if you come look at the countries on it. Um, and it was round until I dropped it last semester, which is convenient because now it stands on its own because I broke the stand it came with a long time ago. 
So that globe is approximately nine inches in diameter. It's approximately the size of a basketball, give or take. So it turns out, uh, so if that's the size of the Earth, how big, so how big do you think the moon is? Tennis ball. Oh, somebody knows the answer. Tennis ball. <laughs> All right. So the moon is approximately the size of a tennis ball when compared to the basketball, or in this case, my nine inch globe. So it also turns out some other fun things to know uh, that uh, the diameter of our manifest destiny country is approximately the diameter of the moon. Uh, so to think about some things there. So. All right, your next quiz question. How far away do you think the moon is? I'll walk, you tell me when to stop. All right, we have a vote for here where this little piece of gum is, all right? Okay, we have a lot of votes for where this microphone hole is. And more votes for this other piece of gum. <laughs> Not quite that far. Uh, I conveniently placed the tape measure ahead of time. That's 21 feet. So the scale distance of the Earth and the moon, if the Earth is nine inches in diameter, the moon is about two and a half inches in diameter, is about 21 feet. Uh, which means if you imagine taking a nice big spotlight here, the shadow that the moon casts on the sun or the Earth is quite small. So uh, some other things on this scale, I didn't want to spend a bunch of time on. I'm recycling this slide because, you know, we're all busy, right? So uh, a quarter inch. The International Space Station orbits the Earth on this scale about the diameter of a pencil above the surface of, the, of my model there. Uh, geostationary satellites are about 18 inches. 17, the slide says it's 17, whatever. Uh, the closest on this scale the planet Venus could be would be half mile. I'm too new here to know how far a half mile is, but it's probably not out of the village. Um, Mars, about a mile. Sun, about two miles. And if you ever Google a picture of the Earth and the moon, you'll see this beautiful thing where you see the moon and the Earth right next to each other. And they're not to scale. No one ever says that. But they're not to scale. This is a two-scale image. So there's our Earth and moon physical model and our two-scale model. And actually, that's not too bad. It looks pretty good in here. Um, astronomy is a very old subject. It's also a subject that deals with a lot of very large distances. So it's helpful to have some sense of scale here. Um, and because I got excited when I was making this presentation, I was like, hey, let me grab another thing I've seen. So here is our same scale. So we've got the Earth and it turns out the moon. There's about three and a half-ish moons across the diameter of the Earth. Turns out there's about 11 or 10, sorry, 10 or 11 Earths across Jupiter. The great red spot there is about two Earths in diameter, give or take. Um, and the sun is about 10 Jupiters. So the sun is 10 times 10, 100. Yeah, OK. All right. Uh, we want to talk about eclipses and a little bit about how they happen. So we need to talk about the thing that gets in the way. It's the moon's shadow that's causing the eclipse. So we have to talk about the moon's orbit and the relative locations of the sun and the uh, earth and the moon. So uh, this involves Kepler's laws. You don't need to know them all right now. All you need to do is look at the thing here on the left, the picture on the left, and make the an uh, analogy that the yellow dot is the earth and the blue dot is the moon. <laughs> the moon orbits the earth and it turns out orbits are ellipses. Thank you, Kepler, for telling us that a long time ago. Um, it also means that the speed at which the orbiting object moves is a little faster when it's closer to the central object and a little slower when it's further away. The other implication here is that the angular size of the moon changes. So you can all experience angular size right now. Bring your moon back. Put it close to your face. It takes up your whole sky. You move it away. It takes up less of your sky. Your fist did not change size, right? This is the angular size. So the picture here is a uh, full moon. 
at two different locations in, moon, in the uh, moon's orbit around the Earth. So the size of the moon on the sky, the angular size, changes. It also turns out that the angular size of the sun changes, but the, the Earth's orbit is not a circle either, but uh, it's a little bit smaller of an effect. Here's our scale diagram again, and just showing you the variation in the closest uh, the Earth, uh, the yeah, the closest the Earth can be to the Moon, and the closest the Earth can be to the Moon, uh, the furthest, sorry, furthest the Moon can be from the Earth. Um, what was I going to say there? Yeah, perigee. Uh, this just uh, the peri means close, and the ap means far. G means Earth. Let's move on. All right, so we need a shadow, and that means we need to have things line up, right? So our screen right now is the shadow of my head from the projector light, right? So the projector's the sun here. My head is the thing making the shadow, right? So that is the arrangement we need. We need that new moon arrangement. We need the sun and the moon to be perfectly lined up. Now, when you did your little orbit here, right? Uh, if you want to cover my annoying face, you've got to perfectly line it up, right? What happens if your fist is slightly higher or slightly lower? You don't get an eclipse. The shadow doesn't hit the Earth. So that's what this very complicated diagram is trying to show here. It's trying to show you the uh, entire sky as a sphere. Uh, the thing in the middle is obviously, oops, the Earth. Sorry, I clicked. Um, and the green circle is, in the fancy technical terms, the ecliptic. It's the path the sun takes on the sky. And so if we just draw a line through that Earth and that line, that's off to the direction of the sun. So it turns out, of course, the sun, this is all exaggerated, by the way. Um, the sun, of course, the sunlight's going to hit both the Earth and the moon and cast shadows. And in the orientation shown here, the shadow does not hit the Earth. So, no eclipse. Uh, but uh, you'll notice that there's two places where the eclipse, sorry, uh, yes, two places where the eclipse can occur. Two places where the blue circle, which is the moon's orbit, and the green circle, which is the path the sun takes on the sky, cross. And at those two places, that's when you've got this perfect alignment where you can have uh, an eclipse. Uh, so I made this little animation in uh, the program called Stellarium. It's free. We use this in our labs, uh, teach students how uh, astronomy works. The red line, uh, if you can see that, is the ecliptic. We've got the sun and a couple other planets here and a comet. More about that later. And what I want to point out as this recycles here again is that the moon starts below the ecliptic and then is on the ecliptic for the eclipse and then goes above. So it's going above, uh, sorry, below to above. It is uh, exactly doing what was on our previous slide there. It is at this crossing point where the eclipses can occur. All right. Uh, what did I want to say here? I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> These, this, uh, this diagram shows the phases of the moon. Oh, I remember what I was going to show. Uh, yeah, so just reminding you the phases. So we've got new, all that stuff. You're good with that, I think. Uh, but if we look at this little picture, what I usually have my students do in class is tell me, what do you see? What, are, what does your science brain tell you when you look at this GIF uh, carefully? Uh, hopefully, you remember what I told you a couple slides ago, that the size of the moon is changing. And you can see that the size, hope, well, maybe you can see that the size of the moon is getting a little larger. Um, you may have heard of terms like, ugh, I hate to say it, super moon. That's called perigee full moon, by the way. Um, also, uh, I had to cringe just like two weeks ago when I saw the term micro moon. <laughs> mm, apogee full moon, uh, but that's okay. Um, so the point here is to remind you, the angular size of the moon changes. And why does this matter? Because there are a couple types of eclipses that we're, I'm gearing up to talk about. And so uh, here is the geometry for a solar eclipse. We've got the sun over here on the left. Yes. Uh, we've got 
the Earth on the right, the moon in between at new moon. I've got perfect alignment. And if you've ever been to Walmart at night, there's street lights everywhere. And if you look at the ground, you will see you have multiple shadows. And where those shadows cross, it's darker. Or if you've ever you know, seen a play. Um, so the darkest part of the shadow is called the umbra, like umbrella. And the less dark part of the shadow is called the penumbra. It means next to the darkest part, just like penultimate is next to ultimate. There you go. You didn't know this was an English lesson. Sorry. Um, all right. So there's our scale model again at the bottom. And the point here is to remind you the shadow of the moon is really tiny. And for this eclipse, the width of the darkest part of the shadow, the umbra near where we're at is about 124 miles wide-ish. So not very big. Uh, but the larger part of the shadow, the penumbra is much larger. So there's a much uh, greater chance of you seeing a partial solar eclipse, uh, like the one here on the lower right. Uh, than there is to see a total solar eclipse, which is the one on the upper left. So total perfect blocking. The two on the left are this nice perfect alignment. The difference is the angular size of the moon. So we can have total solar eclipse when the size of the moon is larger on the sky. So where does that have to be? Closer or further? Closer. So. Yeah, closer, bigger moon, cover more sun. Moon further away, cover less sun, annular. So annular from annulus for ring. So uh, it's also sometimes called the ring of fire eclipse. Uh, so again, uh, the type of eclipse you see depends on which part of the shadow you're in and how far away the moon is from the earth. So, um, this will loop. Uh, this is from, a, I think, a Japanese satellite from uh, several years, many years ago, showing uh, a couple things. Uh, one, the reflection of the sun off of the ocean, which is pretty cool. And the shadow of the moon. And that shadow of the moon is, of course, if you were there, that would be where you could see a total solar eclipse. Now, if you look online for eclipse information, you'll also maybe come across the term hybrid eclipse, which honestly I'd never even seen before preparing this talk, but it's kind of cool. Uh, the Earth is round, in case you didn't know. <laughs> so it turns out the distance from the moon to the Earth will change as the shadow passes across the Earth. So depending on where the moon is at in its orbit, you might be too far away and get an annular eclipse, and then just right and get the total eclipse and then proceed back to the, the moon's too far away again. So uh, that's called a hybrid eclipse. So the part, uh, whether it's a total or an annular eclipse will change depending on where you're at on the planet, which is kind of cool. All right. Um, I thought I was done making my talk last night and then I came across this. <laughs> This is the map of Nope. So the total solar eclipse is not in Alfred. It is north of Alfred. Uh, only along this little band will, you, will it be possible to see the total part of the eclipse. Everywhere where it says Nope or Nada is where you will get a partial eclipse. So uh, obviously those are much more common. It covers much more of the continent here. Here's a less funny version uh, of the same thing. Um, so you will have partial eclipses all the way from uh, this part of the world to that part of the world. Great, all right, who cares? We don't live there. Um, we live here. Oh, so close. So the width of this is all about, like I said, about 124 miles. So we are just as sad as the people in Toronto. Um, so we have to go into this part to see totality. Um, in fact, uh, a, a nearby observatory, I think it was Corning, uh, reached out to me and was like, hey, we're, 
I want to be closer to the eclipse, but people are trying to tell me to be open. Uh, are you going to be open? And I'm like, no, I'm telling people to go to the eclipse. In fact, the map tells you to do the same thing. I didn't, I didn't edit this. This is exactly what it says. If you put the little pin on King Alfred, it says, go to the eclipse. Um, so we're only at 99.988%. So you will have part, we will have partial here, which is still great. If you can't go, fine. It's still a really cool thing to see, but I really strongly encourage you to go to totality. Um, the event that's in Danville, Dansville will be at totality. Uh, we will have about uh, two minutes. Uh, so this one doesn't say, oh, there it is at the bottom. Uh, totality duration. For those that can't read that because it's tiny, is two minutes and six seconds, six and a half seconds. So, but who's counting? Um, as you go further north toward Rochester, uh, you're going to get into the three plus minute range. Um, in the parking lot of the Buffalo Airport, it is three minutes and 55 seconds of totality. So, uh, hopefully, I made my case for why you should go to totality. All right, but why? Why care? Isn't 99.88% good enough? Well, not quite in my opinion, but I'm extremely biased because I'm an astronomer. So um, you can go to totality. You get all the, all the benefits of partial eclipse. Uh, you don't get, if you're not in the part, in the, if you're in partial, you don't get what we get in totality, which is to be able to see the corona with your eyeballs, which is great. Um, there are also some other cool things that happen. The temperature will drop, clouds can form near mountains, the wildlife does weird things like birds chirping and then going quiet. Uh, there's uh, potentially some other cool things I'll show you pictures of here in a second. Um, uh, there's also a bunch of citizen science projects, which I did not put links to here, but if you're interested, you can Google NASA citizen science and you can get a whole bunch of uh, links to do things like that. Uh, if you would like to participate in actual scientific research for the eclipse. So, good. All right. Does it tells me I'm on? Okay, good. Sorry, I used up all my energy. All right. So, let's talk a little bit about the sun. It's a science lesson after all, I think, maybe. Um, so, so, I can explain what it is you can see during totality. So, the, I don't care about the core of the sun right now or the, this stuff. All I care about is this stuff over here labeled atmosphere because that's the part we can see. Well, maybe. So uh, there's three layers of the atmosphere that are labeled on the diagram here. The photosphere, that's where you can take photos. You see things like the sunspots. Uh, you can see... Uh, with special filters like the one here in H alpha, the chromosphere, which is just a little bit above. And I didn't know Dave was going to be here, but here's Dave's picture of uh, uh, using one of our telescopes here at Seoul Observatory. And you can see all the little fiddly bits sticking off the sun here, prominence and, and so. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, but then there's this beverage. I mean, um, yeah. uh, the last part. Uh, which the corona, before we stuck things in space, uh, was the only way to see this was during eclipses. Uh, so, uh, in fact, a total eclipse. So if you get a total eclipse, like the picture up here in the upper left, uh, the brightness of the sun is blocked out, and suddenly we can see this glowing material around the outside of the sun. And it extends quite far. It's quite big. Um, I'll talk about what that is in a couple slides, I think. Um, here is a version of a similar kind of photo that Dave took, but during an eclipse, and you can see these prominences sticking off the edge of the sun, which is pretty cool. Um, that actually tells us there's magnetic fields and that the sun is hot and a whole bunch of other cool things. All right. The corona is the, la the furthest away layer of the atmosphere of the sun. It is the most extended and you notice it's got all these beautiful little lines and shapes, almost look like a flower or something. Um, that is all caused by extremely, extremely hot gas. 
uh, one to two million Kelvin. And I know we don't use Kelvin, but it's hot. Um, you know, it, to go from Kelvin to Celsius is 273. Uh, it's real, really hot. Um, in fact, the, it also emits, it's so hot, it emits x-rays. So, you know, if you need to figure out if your bones broke, just go near the sun, I guess. Um, all right, and it can extend, I said that part. Okay, the other thing I wanted to point out here, this one is from the uh, total eclipse in Australia last year, almost a year ago. And every eclipse with the corona will look slightly different because the shape, of all of this stuff you see sticking off the sun here is controlled by the magnetic field lines. In fact, the corona is hotter than the photosphere in the corona. And the reason it's hotter is because the magnetic field lines, which have little charged particles spinning around them, are wiggling around very fast in such a way that it heats up the gas to very high temperatures. And so every single eclipse has slightly different looking coronas. Um, I know an eclipse chaser who has done like eclipse cruises and you know went to Africa and all this sort of thing. And she told me that at one point, and she's old now, but she said at one point she could tell you just by looking at a picture of a total eclipse, which eclipse it was. So um, kind of cool. All right. So there are some other cool uh, effects that you can see during totality. By the way, you only see this if you go into the darkest part of the shadow. If you go to totality, you will not see this from Alfred. Um, so I'll talk about eclipse safety in a bit. Uh, so so there, there are some other interesting effects that you might be able to see uh, depending on where your location is, et cetera. Um, sometimes people talk about the diamond ring. Uh, sometimes people talk about the shadow bands. You can kind of see there's these little black horizontal lines. Is it not? Oh, the mouse pointer. I've been doing that this whole talk. The mouse pointer doesn't show up over there. Sorry. Uh, so if you're on Zoom, you can hopefully see my mouse pointer. Um, all right. There's these little shadow bandy. There's little, little horizontal things like that. Those are the shadow bands. And then this last little bit, this last little peaking bit of light around the edge of the moon is... Uh, the diamond ring. And I've got another slide here that shows some of similar things. Um, so right as the moment, you know, cue dramatic movie music, right? Right at that last moment, as the moon is slowly starting to cover the sun, uh, it turns out the moon is not a perfect ball. It's got craters and mountainy looking things. Right? So, uh, Sometimes little bits of sunlight can make it in between those. We'll call them mountains. They're probably craters type things. So, uh, but uh, you get a little bit of light coming through. So sometimes people describe this, uh, calling it Bailey's beads, uh, and then totality. Beautiful corona. You can look. You can take your glasses off during this part if you're in totality, not here in Alfred. Um, and then the moon uh, starts to go off the other direction, and you get the same type of effect here. Uh, the diamond ring, uh, according to the internet, is when there's only two little, two little beads. I didn't see either of those at the last eclipse, but um, I wasn't that looking that hard for it, so I wanted to see totality. So, eclipse viewing and what we can expect. So here in Alfred, again, you were only going to have partial eclipse. Uh, so you'll see. Uh, very close. It'll come very close. It's going to be covering 99.88% at King Alfred's location. Uh, so we're going to, it's basically touch and go. Um, not going to see to, uh, so the, the corona here. But if you are able to get to totality, then you could actually see the corona here. And that link, again, if you're QR code savvy, uh, takes you to the uh, NASA safe viewing instructions. All right, during totality, this is again Stellarium, and this is a QR code to the news article about this comet, uh, which has a period of about 71 years. Um, it's got the name 12P Pons Brooks, um, and uh, it will reach its closest point to the sun uh, on April 21st. Uh, but here it is on April 8th during the eclipse, 
So there is the sun, moon, the words are over top of each other. That's the eclipse. That's the moment of eclipse here. And uh, you might be able to see during the eclipse, Venus, Jupiter, maybe, and maybe this comet, if it's bright enough. Um, so in, in, if you're in totality. So, um, so I had the fortune of having the ability to travel in August of 20, August 21st of 2017, because classes were not in session. And so I went to Nashville, actually not Nashville. I went to near Nashville because I wanted as much totality as possible. I had two minutes and 33 seconds of totality. Um, here are a couple pictures that I took with um, specialized filters for my camera. Um, so this is my digital SLR here. So this is during uh, some of the partial phases. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly partial to the partial picture on the right uh, as this cloud, which really freaked me out because I was like, I really hope the clouds aren't coming. <laughs> um, it disappeared shortly after, thankfully. Uh, but I think it kind of looks like a, like a Chinese dragon. And I think the sunspots kind of look cool there. So there are some little sunspots on this picture. Um, I also had a setup because I didn't know if there'd be a lot of people gathering around me. There actually turned out to be a few, but um, I used a rear screen projection type setup for my uh, telescope, which uh, NASA calls the solar funnel. So if you're interested in that, you can Google solar funnel. Um, but literally I've got a telescope here and an eyepiece and a oil filter with some material on the end to act as a screen. Uh, I forked over way too much money for a sample of rear screen projection material. Uh, you can use a dollar store shower curtain just fine <laughs> or a piece of paper. Um, uh, but yes, uh, you should only be doing this sort of thing if you know what you're doing with telescopes. Um, you don't want to blind yourself. But I got some pretty cool pictures of uh, the partial phases here with uh, some really nice sunspots um, showing up. Those sunspots, by the way, are related to the magnetic activity of the sun. Those little things sticking off the sun, the corona. Uh, we're reaching what's called solar maximum. And so there's a lot of magnetic field activity. So the corona is probably going to look really interesting for this eclipse. Uh, this is uh, one of my best pictures of the totality. Um, this is actually with my cell phone, no filter, uh, during totality. So uh, during totality, I've read that the brightness of the eclipse is uh, of order, the brightness of the moon. So um, the full moon. Uh, so the picture's a little saturated, but uh, hopefully your eye is being drawn to that thing. That's Venus, which is pretty cool to see in the middle of the day. Um, it was a really weird experience. Uh, as the as the moon started to cover the sun, um, you know, normally with sunset, sun setting over there, sky gets dark over there. But during totality, it kind of got kind of dark everywhere at the same time, which was really kind of bizarre. And uh, the you know things like building uh, business uh, signs turned on their you know their photo cells turned on the lights. Uh, Birds acted like it was dawn before going quiet. Um, I'm standing in a, I was standing in a field, uh, just staring up at the sky and something flew into my leg. I had no idea what that was. Um, so yeah, wildlife kind of does weird things uh, during that time. I managed to get, uh, I, I, after, after enjoying like a minute of the totality, I was like, okay, I'm gonna try taking some photos. So. This was sadly the best photo I got of the totality. I think it kind of looks like the Eye of Sauron, but uh, anyway, it's my it's my special picture, so I like it uh, for that reason. But uh, yeah, that's that's my that's my pitch for going to totality. Um, a common question people keep asking me is, "Hey, when's the next eclipse?" Well, I don't really know how to answer that because. <laughs> It never happens again here this century. So the next one in the continental United States is in 2045. Uh, there's one in 2099 that goes through Ohio. So maybe I'll go visit my family. Um, 
maybe if you want to see the beginning of an eclipse in 2079, you could go over to that part of the state. Uh, but yeah, now is the time to go unless you're unless you're willing to travel, right? Most people can't travel to eclipses. Uh, a lot, you know what? Seventy percent of our planet's covered in water, so a lot of total solar eclipses occur uh, in the ocean. Uh, so, well, not in the ocean, I suppose. You have to observe them from the ocean. Sorry. All right. All right. Come up to last bit, so I think I'm good on time here. So, um, safe viewing instructions. Again, QR code up there, NASA safe viewing instructions. Um, you, I'm sure you can find this stuff. Don't look at the sun. Okay. Uh, did I say don't look at the sun? Uh, you should Google the term solar retinopathy. Um, it turns out this is from the Mayo, the Cleveland Clinic, which is the QR code. Actually, that's the QR code. This one takes you to the QR to the uh, Cleveland Clinic's information on solar retinopathy. Your eyeball does not have pain receptors, so you won't know you're burning your eye while it happens. So don't do that. <laughs> wear eclipse glasses, which are freely available right there on the table at several, at pretty much every library. Also, there was just an article. Um, I can't remember if this, this one. I've got it on the slide. I'll show at the end again. Um, there was a New York Upstate. If you, if you Google New York Upstate uh, eclipse viewing or eclipse glasses, uh, pretty much every New York Welcome Center and every rest stop on 90 is handing out free eclipse glasses. So in my opinion, no one should be paying for them. They're pretty much free everywhere. So including right there. Um, so one way to view the eclipse is, of course, to put on the glasses and look up, right? Not look up, then put on glasses. Look, put on the glasses, then look up. Um, and what's really great about these is when you hand them to somebody, your first instinct is to go, oh, I don't see anything. That's the whole point. <laughs> they block, well, I don't know the number, but 99.9, whatever, some huge percentage of the sun so that it is safe to look at, okay? Um, also, these are designed, uh, you, you're not gonna, you're not, you shouldn't put these on and then stare at the sun for four hours. Um, also, your neck's gonna hurt, so don't do that. Look at it in doses. Uh, the other way to look at the sun during an eclipse is to make a projection. Um, so you don't need a fancy little projector like this. This is from the art class uh, earlier uh, last fall. Um, but you can just literally take a, I meant to bring it and I forgot in my rage to walk over here. Uh, I forgot, uh, you can just put a hole in a piece of cardboard or, or not cardboard, uh, like a index card, right? Uh, and do this sort of thing. Uh, I did that when I was like, in sixth grade, whatever that was. It was like five, I have no idea. Um, or you use anything with a hole in it. Look at this, colanders. That's a good way to do it. Um, you can use saltine crackers, but what are you doing? You are taking sunlight, the projector, and you are letting the sunlight hit the thing with holes and you're looking at the projection. You are not looking through the hole because that's not a filter. Okay, just covering my bases here. Uh, there are, if you are the kind that's inclined to do something like photography, there are specialized filters you can buy. Clock is ticking, prices are going up. Um, if you've got telescopes, there are special filters. But again, I highly recommend that if you don't know what you're doing, stick to the glasses, stick to projections. Those are pretty safe. Um, if you want to know more, you can pick an astronomer's brain. Uh, I'm going to be using a solar funnel and the glasses and my filter for my camera if I can find it and if it doesn't have a hole in it. That's the other thing you should do before you use these is you should hold them up to a normal light and make sure you do not see any light coming through. Because if you put a pinhole in it, it is no longer a filter. Or at least not a good one. So my last little reminder, if you stay here on campus, you will be wearing these the whole time unless you're looking at a projector. If you go to totality, you can experience 
the corona. So, oh, and, but wait, there's more. Uh, in addition to maybe seeing Venus, we should see Jupiter up to the other direction and potentially a comet. Um, if you want to Google that comet and cannot remember that it is called 12P Pons Brooks, you can Google Devil's Comet because apparently that's what the media decided to call it. So, I, I don't know. I can't. I, I like 12P Brooks, well, Pons Brooks. That, that works for me. All right. So, you guys ready? I lied. It's a summary. Um, that's, that's pretty much my talk. Um, I would like to give a big thank you uh, to be, well, first of all, to being invited to give this presentation, but also to the people that uh, I roped into taking over planning of Eclipse stuff for me. <laughs> um, so thank you to everyone that has participated in that. And I would just like to end uh, with the reminder, the observatory is gonna be closed. You don't need an observatory to see the Eclipse. Got these. Um, there are some other events happening uh, where we'll be a Native American speaker on the Thursday before the eclipse on campus. I strongly recommend that. And then if you're interested in seeing the eclipse from totality uh, and don't have a destination in mind, um, there is uh, a bus that Res Life has for students with 36 seats and the alumni association, uh, uh, the alumni, uh, Janet Marble and Alumni uh, Relations, I guess that's the word, um, has uh, reserved the Dansville Country Club. And so we are going to go there. I will be there. I got roped into doing that. So I'll be there with my little projector and glasses and such. And if you want to know more information about, if you have family members somewhere else in the state, you can point them to this link um, to find out where they can get glasses locally for free. And uh, that's my presentation, so. Any questions for Josh? Hi, Josh. First, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I just had a, a really small technical question. When you were taking images of the sun with your DSLR, were you, I know you were using a filter, but were you also using a star tracker or did you need one or not? Uh, I did not use a star tracker because the sun is really bright. Uh, and with the, um, uh, even with the filter, uh, I was able to adjust the exposure time so that I didn't have to worry about motion blur. Um, so I was not. I just had a standard old tripod. Uh, also, I recommend if you are going to do that, only use the viewfinder screen or the, the, use, the, mm -hmm. use the live view. Because what happens if that filter does come off uh, is you will set fire to your detector. Uh, uh, which could be your eyeball. So don't do that. Um, so use the live view is the best. So that's what I did. I had the live view on. I was like, you know, worst case scenario, if I screw up, I've all I've done is destroy the camera. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, companies that rent out big lenses um, often end up with destroyed lenses after eclipses. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, uh, yeah, probably a, if you are going to use a lens, probably not one that has mirrors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how how complicated is it to um, work out when an eclipse is going to be? Like, could any um, physics undergraduate with good information do it? Could mm -hmm. normal people do it? Or do you have to be a physicist? Well, okay, I'll, this is what I'll say about, uh, I, I, did, I purposely avoided this topic, um, but what I will say about predicting eclipse, eclipses is it's actually really impressive to me that as far back as at least the Babylonians, they were able to predict when eclipses would occur. Um, if you want to know more information, you can Google something called the Saros cycle. Uh, there's lots of information out on there on that. However, you can predict eclipses pretty uh, well for 
these cycles, but for very long periods of time, it, it becomes more difficult. There's a lot of moving pieces, the sun, the moon, the earth, the fact that the orbit of the moon's an ellipse, the orbit of the earth is an ellipse, the fact that the moon's orbit, if you imagine the ellipse, also does this over time, it's called precession. Um, there's a lot of things happening, a lot of moving pieces. So to predict eclipses really far into the future, you need computers and a lot of knowledge. So there's something called the five millennium canon of eclipses. Uh, we have a copy of in the physics department. It's like that thick. Uh, most of that stuff's digitally available now um, from NASA. So uh, yeah, but, well, hopefully that answers the question. I just have a quick and super depressing question, which is that uh, I am going to be in the air flying back from a conference that day. So like, how does being up in an airplane affect seeing the eclipse? It won't be in the path of totality, but. Um, do you have a window seat? I believe I do. Yeah. Yeah. Can you get the pilot to tip the plane? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, if you've got a window seat, I would assume if you're flying through the path of totality, you could hope for clouds and uh, see the shadow on the clouds, uh, or you might be able to see the shadow on the ground, depending on, uh, I, I assume you should be able to do that. I know for the last eclipse, there were special eclipse flights where they were intending to tilt the planes so people could look out the window. Um, I don't know more than that. Sorry that you're stuck in a plane for a totality. <laughs> There are two questions on Zoom. Uh, one of them are kids welcome at the Dansville event and then sort of relatedly, so I'll just ask them both at the same time. I teach a class at 320, but would like to encourage my students to go to the Dansville event. It looks like just 14 spaces are available on the bus. Is there a chance for more to be opening up and that this person has 17 students? Uh that would be a question, I think, to direct to Res Life. I think that was the bus they were able to get. Um, you know, uh, as far as the bus reservations go, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not in charge of that, but um, there's also nothing preventing you from driving. Um, and then as far as the Dansville event goes, uh, again, I can't quite speak to that. I mean, I, it was a, the, the original intent of that was to get alumni interacting with students, but I you know, I don't know, care. I don't care. Bring your kids. <laughs> um, as far as I'm concerned, that's fine. Uh, but I, I am, I didn't plan that part of the uh, event. So um, kind of follow up questions. Yeah. Who should they contact in res life? Eliza, Max, uh, Max was the one who was mostly dealing with that. So I, I would, I would direct to Max. Sorry, okay. Max. And that's people, cool. Well, okay. You guys are here. So well, then, I mean, what, what would you like? Yeah. What would you, how would you like to handle this? Hold on, I'll give you the I'll give you the <laughs> mic, and as I bring you the mic, I'm also going to say that another you question was flight. asking if somebody should RSVP if they're not planning to take the bus. So the Dansville event um, is open. The idea was there are two events: one in on campus for students if they cannot leave or slash go to totality. Um, the Dansville event again being in totality. Uh, we have only the 36 passenger bus for the university. Um, we are hoping we can bring, fill that with as many students as possible. Um, there is an RSVP link. We would like to exclusively use that bus for students because students, um, not saying that faculty and staff don't drive, but it's more likely that students don't have vehicles than faculty or staff. So the bus is, I'm going to say exclusively for students. Um, I think the event, though, is open to anyone and anyone can RSVP. I think that answers those questions. Sounds good to me. I might also suggest, and given the person I'm about to hand the phone, the microphone to, we might say the same thing. Uh, there are university vehicles that clubs, et cetera, can indeed take out, presumably for this, because I would classify this as a university event if a club wanted to take a trip 
together to do this. They can actually take it out if they needed to, but I was going to suggest that if there's enough interest from you guys, um, if there are, if there's a need to have more shuttles and we have the actual shuttle vehicles available that I have a growing number of drivers, I myself am planning on going up there. And if it ended up being something where we had a shuttle available, I would be willing to drive it to take more kids. So you guys just have to get, get in touch with me and let me know if you're going to need that. I'll try to arrange what I can. Crowdsourcing at its best. Yeah, while the microphone's making its way to Dave, I'll just say also, make sure you plan for lots of backed up traffic if you do travel. That's where I was going. Um, yeah. <laughs> the uh, the estimate for the Buffalo area, even with the weather that Buffalo is likely to have is a million extra people. Rochester, around half a million. There's a traffic jam expected to the west of Chautauqua Lake because of construction there that may be, according to the person I talked to at the rest area, 10 hours long. Mm -hmm. um, when we went in 2017, as Professor Maros will say, we were very smug because we came a day early and we left a day later and watched the traffic jams on Google. So I wouldn't take a car to Rochester, university or otherwise. Yeah, that's excellent advice. And there's a question down here. While I bring the microphone to Danny, I'm going to ask a question that I hope doesn't cause things to be thrown at me. Uh, what do you recommend we do if it's cloudy, as oh. it often is in Western New York? Yes, that was your question. Okay, well, the 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 double question here is what to do if it's cloudy. Um, well, if it is cloudy, you will get to experience darkness, so there is that if you're in totality. If you're here, you can experience a brief second of darker. Um, but also in this room, uh, the plan is to show a live stream from somewhere in totality. So if you would like to watch totality, you could do it here on the big screen. Um, uh, if you wear the glasses for the live stream, I don't think you're going to see much. <laughs> if you do, those glasses don't work. <laughs> well, they work as glasses maybe, but not as eclipse glasses. Yeah. Yeah, there's another question, yeah. Or comment, one of the two. This is probably gonna be a stupid question. And no I, such there thing. are such things, yes. There are. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there really are. I work in facilities. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is it plugged in? The picture you had up there of supposed totality, I don't. you don't need to pull it up, but it looked like it was very freaking bright out. Um, and that's supposed to be like nighttime. You're saying so. Oh. What am I missing? What's the oh. Dispar oh, yeah. disparity between looking like a slightly cloudy day versus it's supposed to be black out in nighttime? That's an excellent question. Uh, this is a long what? exposure. Uh, I had my cell phone set for like, uh, you know, I don't know, probably something like a second or two. So there's a relatively long exposure. Uh, most exposure times for most cam pictures, like in this room, will be fractions of seconds. Um, so yeah, this is a slightly long, which is why, which is why you can't see the moon covering there because there's, it's actually so much lights coming around the sun. It's actually saturating the image. Yeah. So in order to take, um, no, when I, when I took, no, this is great because when I took this photo, I was a much shorter exposure. You'll notice the sky is dark. You don't see Venus, which should be about here. Uh, but I can now pick out the moon. And this was, I think, setting my cell phone as to shorten exposure as it could go. So um, also, I don't remember the name of the app, but I just so I have a phone that has a I can adjust all the settings on manually. But there I did just come across there is an iPhone app. I can't remember the name of it um, that will let you do things like change the exposure chime on, on your iPhone camera. So if you've got an iPhone. I have an Android, so. I don't have to worry about that. Other questions? Oh, there's one behind you. Everyone's not going to be interested in this, but I did fall for the online and I ordered some glasses that said that it's ISO certified, but can I be sure? And is there a way to test that? Um, excellent question about the ISO certification. Uh, it must have the ISO label on it. If it doesn't, I wouldn't trust it. Um, the uh, 
AAAS, the American Astronomical Association, Association has a list of registered vendors for legit glasses. Um, you could look to see if your vendor was one of those, and then maybe it's just not printed on there. Um, there's really no way of knowing. I mean, the, the one thing you could do is, you know, look at an, a bright light, and if you see light, do not at all use it. Rip it up, throw it in the trash, something like that. Um, personally, I wouldn't use it if it doesn't say ISO on it. So all the ones we have here were ordered uh, from eclipseglasses.com, I think. And uh, these this was the top site on the American Astronomical Society, and these are ISO certified. And they are out. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure. Sold out. But good news, the physics department used. Uh, we have, yeah, we at New York, uh, uh, New York Space Grant. Uh, the physics department used New York Space Grant money, and we bought two thousand five hundred of these. So there's a small fraction of them. There's one hundred and fifty minus whatever just walked away. So. If there's nothing else, please join me in thanking Josh again.